It's a situation that's affecting everyone. In fact, it's not just being called a situation. The term many are now using is epidemic. I'm talking about the opioid epidemic, and it's difficult to find anyone who has not been affected in some way. Hello, I'm Jennifer Beck, welcoming you to a TV44 special, The Opioid Crisis, How is a Christian to Respond? Join me now as I sit down with Professor Keith Durkin of Ohio Northern University, who says the biblical themes of forgiveness, redemption, and faith are key points to helping change the staggering statistics. Professor Durkin, let's talk about this essay which you co-authored, which focuses on the opioid epidemic, which right. undoubtedly has affected pretty much everyone, it right. seems, at this point. Um, let's just go ahead and open up and start talking about what, what led you to want to focus on this topic. Uh, for about the last 10 years, I've worked as a consultant to some of the local juvenile courts, and especially in one of the rural ones, we noticed in about 2013, about one out of every four kids was abusing prescription opioids. Mm. So I, I saw what a problem that uh, this was. And then I realized that all throughout West Central Ohio in, in this region, there, there's literally thousands of people that have had a problem with uh, opioid abuse, uh, drug addiction, they eventually end up on heroin, mm -hmm. and just trying to look as a society, like how can we better understand it, and what can we do to uh, confront the epidemic and, and try to start solving the problems that are behind. So 2013, it's almost 2020 now. Right. Um, so we're looking at, you know, about seven years. Back then you saw the problem happening, right. and it's definitely just snowballed since I, then. Absolutely. In um, 2017, 70,000 people in the United States of America died of drug overdoses. Two thirds of them were uh, opioid overdoses. So if you look at that number, that's more people than died in the entire Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And it's a leading cause of accidental death. So more people die of a drug overdose than a car accident, uh, something to do with guns or a suicide. And of course, those are things we hear about, car accidents, right. guns, and suicides, yet here is this epidemic that is taking our children, taking right. our grandchildren um, at such an alarming rate. Right. Um, so as you did research um, in your, your paper, I love the fact that it dives into not just how did the person get addicted on the pills, but what is the whole picture that got us there. And you really saw a decline over many years that possibly led to this point, a, a change in social atmosphere, right. environment, relationships, that type of stuff. It, it, it's what in, I'm a sociologist, we call macro sociology. So rather than just looking at the individual, and I've done research on that, I can tell you uh, undoubtedly mental illness and mental health problems play a role on the individual level. We wanted to start looking at myself and my colleague, Dr. Dan Phillips, what are the societal trends? And mm -hmm. one of the major trends that has been noticed is people are less involved in social institutions mm -hmm. than they were 20, 30, or 40 years ago, uh, such as church is a great example, right? Uh, church attendance is down. Uh, manufacturing jobs are down. So uh, two generations ago, if someone, a blue collar worker, had a manufacturing union job, it was not just the job, they were a member of the union, they were involved in all kinds of organizations, bowling leagues, softball mm. teams, at this job, and, and that stability isn't there in the lives of a lot of uh, working and uh, middle class folks nowadays. I don't think that that, I mean, that's an excellent point, and I don't think that's something that the average person's got to stop and think about. Right. Okay, my loved one is, is addicted, but, so we, we, we can't necessarily fix that in the addicted person's life now, yeah. but going forward, there can be some changes that could help prevent things. Right. And, and so that's where these, of course we live in this social media age where everybody's on their phones yeah. and they're supposedly so connected with people, but yet it's very they're shallow, yeah. shallow. But there is definitely a purpose for these things. The bowling right. leagues, there's a purpose yes, for that kind yes. of thing. Bigger than we see. Right, I, and it's not just too that uh, PTA membership is down, memberships in like the Elk, the Moose, the Optimist, mm -hmm. the Seroptimist, they're down across society. So we're more, as you said, an individual, we're caught up in our social media and those uh, small organizations that were the backbone uh, of our society in the 70s and the 80s have really dwindled. 
So as we look look at the future, obviously social media is not going to go away. Hopefully that uh, people could catch the idea that social involvement is good, but that's where maybe the church could step in and start to become a resource, right. a good resource. No, absolutely. Church is about more certainly the service and the worship service is a big thing, but, but the church can in religious institutions are and can be so much more. Clubs and organizations around the church, volunteer work with the church, community involvement, that, you know, in a way the church is a uh, institutional social center of sorts, rather than just, you know, you, you check the box on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like churches are doing that already? Or do you think there is room for churches to grow and create programs, initiatives, or really try? I, I think so? there is room for churches to do that. And sometimes you just simply don't know where to start. But whether it's once or twice a, a month going and working at a uh, you know soup kitchen, a pantry, something like that, it's not just obviously it's an act of Christian mercy to serve at the soup kitchen, but you're building relationships with other people that you're involved with. So I, I always think that churches can do even more, and, and I think in a way they they need to do even more. That that church the church can be an anchor of people's identity in their social life like maybe it was two generations ago. Mm, two generations ago, it really, 20 years. Um, it seems like yesterday, at least for I, someone like me, yeah. uh, who's in my mid forties and it does, it, right. but yet so much has changed yes. in two decades. Um, can we get it back? Can we pull things back to the point where we can be a society of relationship again? We, we, we can certainly start trying. Yeah. So we've talked about the growth of the epidemic and what you saw in the juvenile thing and we're seeing now you know drugs are not just a back alley thing we're seeing it right. in the the rural areas we're seeing it among the rich we're seeing it among the poor uh, this opioid epidemic isn't selective no no it's not and the thing about the opiate epidemic that the current opioid epidemic that's different drugs were viewed as a major metropolitan problem you know cities mm. a million plus that's where the people did that uh, at least, especially with the prescription pain pills, they really took off in rural areas and in the smaller metropolitan areas, which is so much of what's around here in West Central Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason, I think people maybe initially didn't view it as a quote unquote drug because you didn't buy it in a back mm -hmm. alley from some shady character. And, you know, if it's something that came out of the pharmacy, it, it can't really be bad. But I don't know if you'd seen recently, uh, the Lima News ran a very interesting story based on data from the Washington Post that between 2006 and 2012, there were like 22 million prescription opioid pills prescribed in Allen County. In Hardin mm -hmm. County, where I do a lot of my work and I live, so Hardin County has 32,000 people, 7.7 .7 million opioid pills were out there. <laughs> so back in the 70s and 80s, you know, think for better or worse, kids rebel a little, they, they experiment, they push the envelope, uh, they would go into the liquor cabinet or steal a spare six pack or something. What happened, we had a generation of kids that went into the uh, medicine cabinet. Mm. And, and with that, they were introduced to uh, just the powerful effects that, that opioids <laughs> have that you don't feel any pain physically, emotionally, psychologically, or not even argue spiritually. It mm. just numbs the individual. Sure, a person could try that and think, hey, I feel better. Right? This is yeah. helping me. Right. I can be a better person in society sure. with this. Sure, and a lot of people, a lot of young people, first were exposed to opioids through a legitimate prescription. And the medical community, the, the average physician was doing what they thought was in the best interest of, mm -hmm. of the patient. You may mm -hmm. remember in the yeah. 90s, they were calling pain the fifth vital sign, <laughs> right? So a lot of kids, they, they would find out, I've talked to several addicts, well, I, I took two one day, and it didn't just help me with my pain, it helped me with my other pain. Mm. And you know, adolescence is hard, mm -hmm. trying to fit in, trying to find your place in the world, mm -hmm. that's a great place the church can come mm. in. To, to help young people with their development and with their identity, is that, that, I, that I'm a child of God right. and that God unconditionally loves me and sent his son Jesus to die for mm -hmm. me. 
but young people, I don't think, are, are getting that message. And, and they self-medicate. It's something called the self-medication hypothesis, that people turn to substances of abuse to uh, medicate pain, and it's not mm. always physical. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, at least they need more, and then they need right. more, and then we, we are where well, we are now. Well, yeah, and how we got here is in, in about 2012, and it was the pharmacy board, it's some medical boards realized we're prescribing way too many of these pills. Uh, yeah. So they did two or three things. First is they restricted the number of prescriptions. Second, oxycodone, which was very popular mm -hmm. drug, people would misuse it by crushing it up to snort it. Mm -hmm. Uh, they changed the uh, characteristics of the pill that you could no longer do that. And as uh, one addict told me, there were too many people chasing too few pills back in 13 mm. and 14. And cheap heroin started to saturate our area. And the person makes a decision, and it's usually through a friend, that'll tell them, hey, it's basically the same high as pills, but uh, people were paying $80 a pill oh goodness, where they could awesome. first... Uh, get their first dose of heroin for five to ten mm. and mm. and it's a rational choice that they make to switch over and now they're hooked on heroin and then in what so that's what we call the first wave of the opioid epidemic was the pills up to about 2010 between uh, 2012 and 2015 it was the heroin and now we're seeing it, it's fentanyl but it's a synthetic yeah. fentanyl that's in a lot of the heroin and the vast majority of the overdose deaths are due to the fentanyl in uh, either the heroin supply or uh, a lot of times people think they're buying a pill that's uh, Percocet 30 or something. Mm -hmm. It's not Percocet 30, mm -hmm. it's a counterfeit pill with fentanyl or some stronger variation in it. And now there are the, uh, you know, there's the, the things that can happen to bring people back. I think Narcan, right, Narcan that's yes. happening quite a bit. Um, but I'm, undoubtedly we have viewers right now who are either have a grandchild or a child who is in their opinion, it's lost. Right. They're lost. They're, they may have overdosed a few times and come yeah. back. These, these people don't know what to expect. So that's where God's love can suddenly come it, it, in exactly. in a new way. The, the, the unconditional love. And I have talked to some people even in the ministry, and I think they, they to be honest, some of them feel awkward with the issue of opioid abuse. Mm. I think that, you know, the Bible says sin is sin. It, it's missing mm. the mark. You know, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But in some way, the opioid folks are, I don't know, super sinners mm. or they're the lepers of our time. And, and to realize that, you know, Jesus died for everyone. Mm -hmm. So recovering from that, let, let's just create a scenario of an individual who truly, they're, they're, they're clean at the moment, right. they want to stay clean, they don't want to go back to that friend group, uh, they do want a, a Christian network around them, but the healing process takes a while. Right, that's a great point. I, I tell people, and certainly in the Christian community, there are uh, a number of people in any congregation, maybe we're delivered from alcohol, you know, and especially those uh, children of the 70s and 80s tobacco, mm. right? They, I quit smoking, it was horrible. This is so much different. Mm. This drug has such a powerful grip on people, and it's not a character thing. It's not a psychological thing. Opioids, uh, for lack of a better term, rewire the neuroprogramming of mm. the brain. And it can take uh, 12 to 18 months for the person to kind of come back to normal. So as you were saying, they're doing the right thing. They're getting involved in a faith community. You know, the cravings from tobacco and alcohol, people lose in a few weeks or a few months. These cravings go on long term. Mm -hmm. And go back to what I said about self-medication. One of the basic issues here is the person started to abuse opioids because they had an emptiness and they had challenges in their life. Mental illness is a big one. With that or mental health, uh, mood disorders, depression, general anxiety disorder, or a huge one is traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder. So mm -hmm. with the young people, let's say some of my research now shows that about 40%, uh, I just finished a study, it'll come out in January, 
uh, from a local family drug court. So these are parents who are addicted to heroin trying to keep custody of their kids. At least 40% of them fit the criteria for traumatic stress disorder. So you can see a young woman had some horrible abuse experiences when she was younger. You know, took an extra Vicodin because it made her forget those intrusive yeah. thoughts and ended up in this vicious cycle. And I, I think for viewers to understand, nobody wanted to be putting a needle in their arm. Mm. Yeah. That, you know, it, it was not, you know, you wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to inject heroin. It, it doesn't work that way. It was a slow process that also gripped their brain. And we need to be understanding that. That's the word that was coming to my mind. We as a Christian culture, need to have a different level of understanding right, right. for these people yeah. who, and, and I don't want to use the word these people. These are people. They're humans. Ch yes. Yeah, they're, they're children of God. They're, they're children of God's creation, God's. just like anybody yes. who hasn't been addicted. Yes, yep. and God has a plan Christ, for Christ those Christ went to the cross too. at Calvary for those people too. Yeah. Right, it, but that's the one strength we say in the essay, myself and Dr. Phillips, the church is especially positioned to deal with this epidemic to individuals because the church is where forgiveness is really practiced. Forgive doctrines of forgiveness, uh, second chances, you know, prodigal children and reintegration is the fabric of the Christian doctrine. It is the fabric of both Old and New Testament. I have to point out to people that, you know, um, David committed murder and adultery, mm -hmm. right? Um, Noah had an issue with drinking, right? And Rahab was a prostitute that we sometimes get so caught up in judging other people that we don't see that. And Paul, right, wrote half of the New Testament. Basically, we call him a war criminal today for the genocide he committed. So we've got to practice this love, right, right to people. Because this is a two-way street. What does an opioid addict think when he or she's walking in the church? That took some courage to walk in the church. That took some courage to come down to altar call. To I would think there could be some shame, a lot of shame. That we can't even of think fear. of. Um, uh, and and, and then trying to not go, hey, I'm feeling that fear, so I'm going to go get a high so exactly, that I exactly. can make I it through this. It. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing we got to be mindful of, it's not just the stigma of being addicted to the drugs the type of things individuals need to do to finance that addiction, which we're up to about $100 a day. So they've committed crime, they've lived a criminal lifestyle, they may have engaged in prostitution, regardless of gender, that, that we gotta understand that there's a lot of issues that they're gonna need to, to address in, in the unconditional love that a faith community can give that the unconditional love the Father gives us. This is really a chance to practice that. And we can also quickly, um, you know, integrate these people when, when, when they get some sobriety into ministry type of work. And I'm pretty honest uh, about myself. I had, was an alcohol abuser when I was a young man. So, and, and even members of the church, not to be ashamed of that. Mm -hmm. How quickly when we're delivered mm -hmm. and, Oh, well, see, not, we're, we're not, good now. Now I'm a certain I can't believe guy. that you now, do that. Yeah. that you, people wouldn't believe my story. Yeah. It's a good thing for Facebook. There's people who remember me when I was younger. But that we have people in, in our church, if we know of them, and, and have them willing to work with them, willing to honestly share with them. And I do find a lot of even church members, once they get delivered from maybe plenty of drug addicts, alcoholics, this type of thing, maybe dishonest people, they just want to leave the past in the past. Mm -hmm. And that, that we can communicate to folks facing addiction that they're not alone, right? That the blood of Jesus helped us so much mm -hmm. that, that that's there for you. And, uh, you know, we, we got to do some self-examination as a church. Right? And I will tell you that I think people view uh, heroin and opioid addicts with a greater degree of uh, suspicion than they deal with alcoholics, mm -hmm. most certainly. So, so with that, as we get ready to close um, and we, we think about what we as Christians can be doing, what should we, how should we view them? Um, instead of having that stigma of, hmm, 
opioid, opioid, opioid addict, addict. I, I'm not sure. No, we, we need to focus on, we, to, to see people, you know, the Father sees us covered in the blood of Christ, right? And doesn't mm -hmm. judge us, right? The yeah. blood of the Lamb covers us. That we really need to put that into practice, right? The most, you know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Mm -hmm. They've accepted Jesus, right? And even if that person has a setback, we don't want to become judgmental if that setback happens. A absolutely. And, and we also have to view, even in the church, modern behavioral science. We, we know a lot of things, and there are actually people of faith in, in behavioral science. We say relapse is part of recovery. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the enemy goes for any of us at our weakest point. Mm -hmm at that vulnerability we have as a person in our, our spirit. So, so it makes sense that they're gonna go back to the, the enemy's gonna attack the addict, he's gonna tempt the addict, right? And we have to view them, I, I, you know, uh, we, we're not perfect, we're just forgiven. Every Christian I know still commits sin. So um, we, we don't view that, it too, not to take it as a personal disappointment. I think you're talking about parents and grandparents, a lot of times I, I think when I deal, they see themselves as a failure, right? Maybe mm -hmm. I wasn't a good parent, I wasn't mm -hmm. a good boy, husband, brother, what, what have you. This issue is bigger than the individual. They need to not blame themselves and they need to work on trying to support the person as they go through recovery. And if the person relapses, we don't write them off. God didn't write mm -hmm. anybody off, right? Mm -hmm. That we just gotta meet them where they're at and continue to support them. Continue to support them with Christ's love unconditionally. Unconditionally. Just the way he loves every see, one of us. See the addict the way Christ would view. Yeah. Okay. All right. Professor Keith Durkin from Ohio Northern University, thank you so thank much you. for sharing this information with us and our viewers, and thank you for your research. Um, we pray that God gives you opportunities for more research because we know that God can use it for great things. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. One of the things we didn't discuss in the interview you just watched are the value of groups like Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, both of which Professor Durkin makes reference to in his essay. There's another group that is also proving its success in creating a safe environment for those who want to get clean and stay clean, Celebrate Recovery, which offers several meeting sites right in this area. Recently, the nationwide organization celebrated their 10-year presence in Lima. The truth is what happened just over 10 years ago was I was going back to work, listening to praise and worship music, and heard about a group in Fort Wayne that worked with faith-based and anyone's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. I thought, this is important. This would be something that Kelly actually would really gain from and the men and women I was working with would gain from. Never my wildest dreams did I understand it was something so important for me. So Kelly and I went on a trip to learn about Celebrate Recovery and from there? And from there it just took off. When I think about the individuals that started, uh, including myself, I know that my life has completely changed. Seeing a lot of the men and women that are now in recovery from depression, from post-traumatic stress, from substance use, that are now out in other churches beginning to not only do God's worth but to attend a church has been such a blessing. Sela has always been near and dear to all of our hearts and we've just continued to be touched by their music. We knew how much they blessed us, how much they blessed our participants when we used their music um, at our meeting nights and um, we just knew that that was the best way that we could possibly celebrate 10 years. Finally, we want to remind you, there is hope. We first introduced you to some special friends during the Night of Hope earlier this year on TV44, but their stories are worth repeating. 
If you have a loved one who is fighting addiction, do not give up. Keep praying and realize that God is working in ways we don't always see. When I was 15, about the time I stopped believing in God. Uh, that's when I first did my first line of cocaine and fell in love with it and kept doing that and end up leading to doing pills and uh, meth and during most of my 20s was doing about anything and everything that can catch me a buzz. Went through my divorce and it was a real messy divorce and everything and um, needed something to bring me down because I was getting all pissed off all the time and heroin I knew would work so just picked up a needle and just started shooting and kept on doing it for a couple of years until all our friends ended up going to prison ended up picking it back up and uh, kept on doing it for a few more years and ended up overdosing June 23rd of 2017 um, body was on the floor in the bathroom about 5.30 that night when I got home from work. And my wife ended up finding me when she got home from work about 11.30. And my temperature was 90.7 degrees and my legs was swelled up because my kidney shut down and released all the toxins into my legs. And they had to do relief cuts on my legs and my upper thigh and my right side. And had to learn how to walk again, was in intensive rehab for a couple weeks and everything and got out of the hospital August 14th of that year and um, kept shooting up for a couple of years after that, about a year after that. And then uh, went to that night of hope in St. Mary's at the end of July and ended up getting saved. We ended up selling our trailer in Jackson Center and I moved in with my mom and she moved in with her mom and everything and um, the last time I overdosed that was I was done and because I cheated death three times and knew that I probably ain't got another shot left so just kind of stuck to my groups and my Bible studies and going to church and everything. Monday nights I go to an AA meeting in St. Mary's and um, Tuesday nights I go with my dad to his Bible study. Wednesday nights I go to my church for my Bible study. Uh, Thursdays at noon I go to an AA meeting in St. Mary's and um, from five to six I go to Coleman's for group in St. Mary's. It's drug counseling there and on Fridays, days I have my laundry day, and Saturdays I just lounge around, and Sundays I go to church, and just getting that routine of having something to do every day kind of like motivates me to, you know, just stay in the habit and staying away from 75, staying away from Dayton. You know, those are two big triggers. Because looking back, you know, from the time I stopped believing to the time I got saved again, my life was just nothing but chaos and I was always angry all the time and just everything was just out of control even though I thought I could manage you know I, I was still able to work so in a way I was like a functioning addict so I thought I had a control of everything but I didn't you know control is just an illusion and but now if I ever have a problem I just turn it over to him and I actually have peace now which is a very nice feeling. appreciate the information that we shared in this show. Are you grateful that we have an opportunity to spread not just this message, but the message of Jesus Christ all throughout the region free of charge? Well, we are able to do so thanks to the many financial donors who keep us going through this year and into next year. 
we are still raising money for our 2020 annual funding campaign and we have not yet reached our $250,000 goal. We appreciate all donations between now and the end of December, getting us one step closer to that $250,000 goal. You can donate online at WTLW.com, call us 419-339-4444, or write us or visit us at 1844 Beatty Road, Lima, Ohio, 45807. Together, we'll continue into the year 2020, reminding people there is hope in Jesus, there is freedom from addiction, and Jesus Christ is the answer.